<laughs> I love to hear it. Unfortunately, you have to put a stop to it. So yeah, I know. Uh -huh. So make sure you read your bulletin, okay? Read your bulletin. All right. Um, you know, given given the we had, I think we had a fair turnout yesterday for the depressing topic that we had to cover. And uh, it was, I thought, thought it was extremely informative. Uh, I vaguely remember Stephanie, because I was working there when she did, and, and I know Dr. Schweitzer, and he, he remembered me after I enlightened him a bit. But uh, I, I thought the information was, was really good, and it's something that uh, if you were here, it's something that you know we all need to look at. So, um, I don't, did they leave? Do you know if they left any, any material? They did a little bit. Okay. So, uh, um, not the papers that you fill out. For oh, the okay. But they did some pamphlets and things. Okay. So it's if, on the back table. If you were here, grab some of that information and, uh, look at it. No matter <coughs> how old you are, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, next upcoming event for the congregation is trunk or treat. We need candy. We also need participants. Thank you. And uh, I think I might go as Moses again this year because I do have the Ten Commandments I could use, and I also have something else that I could use. But uh, that's up to you. Whatever you want to do. And uh, but please come and help us out. We always have a good time watching the kids. So, with that being said, uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. Lord, thank you for blessing us with this day and for this hour of study. And we pray that as we open the book to Romans 13, that uh, what is said and done would be one pleasing in your sight and truthful. We thank you for Jesus, for his love and his sacrifice. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so now we are on chapter 13. We only have three more chapters, and then we're going to actually begin another study. Uh, it's based on a, what, what is that? A bookmark? Mm -hmm. It's a bookmark study. Okay? It'll be fun. Yeah, and it's, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like what we're doing on Wednesday night, but not exactly. Okay, so we'll see. So, chapter 13, our scripture reading for today is Colossians 3, 13 and 14. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also sh should you be beyond all these things put on love. Oh, so also should you beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And that's what we're basically going to be talking about in, in Romans 13. There are some other things, but I think that's the foundation of what we're looking at. So, in Romans 12, what we looked at was the first thing he opened it with was living sacrifices. Compared to the Jews knowing that when they sacrificed, that animal was dead. But now they are to be the living sacrifices just as we are. Uh, the other thing we looked at in that in, in verse 2 was because of these living sacrifices, our lives are transformed. And the video clips that we've been looking at um, from Romans 1 until now, the whole idea is Jesus is creating a new humanity. In other words, once you become a believer and a follower, the old man is dead and the new man lives. So it's a new humanity, a new person. And that's basically what he's talking about in the transformed lives. By renewing what? what do you, how do you get a transformed life? Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Just, and that was a good move. I don't think I can do that anymore. What's that? <coughs> uh, the other thing that he talked about is being humble servants. In verses 3 through 8, you're not thinking of yourself more highly than somebody else. In other words, you're dethroning yourself. And we have a problem with that. 
We have a problem with dethroning self. Uh, I don't know if that was a 60s movement or a 70s movement, but it's still moving, okay? And I guess that's the problem with selfishness. Uh, near the end of the chapter, he's talking about being united in Christ. And that's basically what we're going to be talking about again in 13. Because in uh, 9 through 11, it was the Jewish problem. And uh, 12 and 13, he's basically focusing also on being united in Christ through love, as our passage, our scripture reading mentioned. And then, because of that, we're not to take vengeance. So why is he telling these these Gentile Christians and these Roman Christians all this in chapter 12. I need my cricket sound. I wish I had yeah. <laughs> I have a question about vengeance. Now, is self-defense considered vengeance? No. Good. Then no. I vengeance. Take them out. Vengeance is... Uh, <clears throat> All right, vengeance is what was in the Old Testament. That was actually taught. An eye an eye, a tooth for a tooth, an arm for an arm, a leg for a leg, a life for a life. Mm -hmm. And But in the New Testament, under the different law, that's changed. But yeah, you watch a TV show and you see the villain and the person playing the villain does such a good, good part, you just want to take them out. That's vengeance. That's a, that's a feeling of vengeance. But that's a feeling. It's not doing. And vengeance is actually being focused on taking it out. We've been watching, uh, we've been watching a, a BBC series called Merlin. It's about King Arthur. And two characters in there. There's two characters that they are so, um, what is it? They're so focused on getting one getting control and two taking vengeance on what happened to them when they were younger and that's their whole purpose but it leads to all other problems so uh, if vengeance no that is not the christian way so you're on the highway and you have an aggressive driver behind you and they're doing all kinds of things to irritate you and how do you deal with that break check <laughs> break check no how would you deal with somebody like that? It's an aggressive driver. In self-defense, can you toss a grenade out the window? If you had one, but that's still illegal. Darn it. Also, discharging a firearm while you're driving is illegal. I dropped it. I dropped it and placed it perfectly behind me. Yeah. So how do you react with an aggressive driver? <laughs> well, I think to avoid a, you know, a seemingly terrible accident at 70 miles an hour you just back off and don't become like that person yes yeah i mean that's i know <laughs> sometimes it's like no i don't want to do that but the adrenaline kicks in and the fight or flight and it's not flight it's i'm gonna, I'm gonna knock your car off. well you know and, and, and your mind it all depends on who's in the car with you yeah. you know you do kind of when you're by yourself it's like nobody's gonna see me do this and it's like oh wait yeah somebody is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things that, that, that still comes to mind, and this has happened many, many years ago. I did something, and uh, I think I blew the horn at, at a guy or something. He's an elderly gentleman. And he diffused the whole situation. I mean, I was upset. And I just laid on that horn, and he just went, and I... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm the jerk. Yeah, when, the, when the other person realizes they did something wrong, and you, without even hearing words, and you can tell they're they're apologetic to you by uh -huh. waving and you kind of sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But taking vengeance is not the Christian way. So then we get into chapter 13. Uh, well, the whole the whole thing about chapter 12 is dedicated <laughs> service, and not to yourself, but to others. Okay, and that is based on the foundation of what? Dedication, dedicated service to your brothers and sisters is based on what? Love. 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 And it doesn't have to be the, the Twitter painted type of love. It is a decision to love. 
All right, chapter 13. Um, this chapter is based on uh, what I was looking at. There's, there's three things that's going on in this chapter. The first one is believers in authority. The second one is believers in your fellow man. And the third one is believers in the last days. Okay, so let's take a close look at these three categories. So the believers in authority is found in, in uh, verses 1 through 7. And so I'm going to go ahead and read that. It says, every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For it is a servant of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a servant of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, there's two therefores, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, respect to whom respect, honor to whom honor. So, why do you suppose Paul starts the chapter out with this? No. <laughs> Very, very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's all in, in that area, it was always tax season. You're always getting taxed. But else, what was. What government ruled? Rome. Okay? So Rome was the governing authority. In this at this particular point in time, who was the emperor? Take a guess. Caesar. Well, that's what his name was, but who, what was, that was his title. Is that Augustus? No. Take a guess. Nero? Yes. Nero. Not Baro? Yes. Not, no. That's when you're, Nero is when you're close, Baro is when you're far away. Yeah. All right. So it was Nero. So how are they to live in a situation like that? Because we find out now we're dealing with persecution. Unjust taxes. Persecution because of whom they believed. You have the Jews and the Gentiles living together. You know, Paul is trying to unite them regardless. So how are they to live? Under the government. Under the authority of the government. They had to live under that governing authority. So they had to pay the taxes. We had to do what was supposed to be done. All right. Wait a minute. I have another question. What lessons can we learn from this? I put up a couple here. Uh, as followers of Christ, we are under a king. Just as they were under a king or a Caesar, they were subject to that king. As followers of Christ, we are also subject to the king both in this world, but most importantly, in the world to come, because our king is not of this world, and neither is his kingdom. <coughs> is the church in this world? Yeah. Or is it... Is, We're in the world, but not of the world. Yeah, okay. So it's a spiritual kingdom of the called out. Let's look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11a, and then uh, 13 and 14. 1 Peter 2. <clears throat> 11a, and then 13 and 14. Okay. Who's got it? Okay. Whereas angels who are greater in the power and might do, nope. not, 
That's not First Peter. First Peter two. Wrong one. You were close. Someone else's guy. I got uh, dear friends. I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Okay, and thirteen and fourteen. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent to him, sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Okay, so here we find out that as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are actually strangers and aliens. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Okay? So we are strangers and aliens. We were once part of the world, but now we are called out of the world. And knowing what we have learned about Christ, we are now strangers. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We are to be subject to the governing authorities. Just as he has said in Romans chapter 13 in the first, first verse, now we read in 2 Peter the same thing. Interesting to note, two different men saying the same thing. And Peter was writing to the Jews. Is that just the governing authorities we like and agree with? <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. No, you, you raise a good question, though. Okay? So why are we to govern, or why are we to obey the authorities? And the, 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 the book tells us. Can you say God put them there? For That's one. God put them there. You may disagree with it, but God put them there. Yeah. Nero needed to be crucified himself for what he did. But God took care of that. Sure. Okay. Um, but okay, that that's one. God put them there. What what's the other? Can you think of another reason why we are to obey the governing authority? It's supposed to be subject to the rules and authorities as invited. Okay. Why? Why are we to be subject? Again, God put them there. Yeah, but there's another reason too. Okay. But you're you're right. So don't we don't incur judgment on ourselves? That's another one. If we don't obey human authority, why would we obey God? Uh, that's a that's a good one. If we don't obey human authority, why would we obey why would we obey God? God can put them in authority. He did. Right. He did. Um, let's let's look at uh, verse one and then five and seven of chapter thirteen. So verse 1 says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So God put our current president in a position of authority. Yes or no? I want to say I guess. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. 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 But he's got he a did. sense of humor. <laughs> okay. Now let's go to uh, 5 and 7. He says, therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. Okay. It, I like that way he started that out. Therefore. In other words, everything that was there before. Uh, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Yeah. I Here like it comes. This is going to be a Harveyism. I just know it. And this might be a, a radical question, but if we were to be su subject to governing authorities, does that mean that America was in the wrong? Uh, separating themselves from. Oh, you're going to go with the Revolutionary War. You know they, that was terrible, but it, that we're going under the uh, the assumption that God put King, whatever his name, George, George, the whatever. I know your history. Okay. Jump. <laughs> was it the third? George the third. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
There. Yeah. King George the Third okay. in charge, and God put him there. Was it okay for us to rebel to separate ourselves from? I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> well, I'm just asking. I tried that. I got attention. Um, because it's been so long, you know. But now we can, on the outside looking in. You you pose a good question. <laughs> You don't yeah. have to answer. I Brad, you got, a, you got an answer to help me out here with that? Yeah, you got it. Well, I think the idea that, that God's putting all these leaders in their position is, is probably not right. Because that goes against our free will if we're electing officials, right? What free will do we have if God's just going to do that, right? But that doesn't mean God can't use that or God doesn't know what these leaders are going to do, good or bad. Um, but God can always use that for his purposes, too. So you're saying that the democratic process of voting someone in office is is really not in his hands? Well, how God created humans, therefore, if humans elect humans, it's still under God because he's the one who created everything. Yeah, so I, I technically can see it's under, that could still be we're, under. We're going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. that you've done a couple uh, things. Um, you start talking about the government. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is it? Religion and politics, and we just hit both of them. So, um, but however you look at it, however that person has come into power, and I mean, we could we could pose a lot of questions regarding that. I mean, we could go and look at the dictators that have rose to power and have caused a lot of problems. I mean, come on, Nero. Okay, Nero was a dictator, and how did he, you know, he came into power. You got something, Brad? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I kind of feel like when, when you say that God <coughs> puts these people in power, it sort of makes it sound like, okay, well, God's going to be in charge of everything like that, and, and he can be, but that doesn't mean he, I don't think that's his personality to just take control of everything. He allows it. It wasn't like with Joe. <coughs> Where God was like, okay, yeah, we're going to kill your family, make you sick, make you poor, and all that stuff. Okay. You know, that stuff happened to, to Joe, and God restored him. Yeah. And God can restore everything here, too. Right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean God was, I mean, just because God allowed it doesn't mean he was in charge of it. Okay. All right. I get your point. Yeah. It's, it's all in God's time. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah. God yeah. wouldn't want someone to work evil because he's not about it. Correct. And, and your point is, is well made because he does. He'll use that. He'll use the democratic process for his purpose. Uh, sometimes we paint God out to look like the Greek gods where they manipulate men to do this, that, and the other. They'll place them over here. Well, you're going to die and then you're going to live. And, you know, God is not a god. He's not one of those God. David, you got something. You're, you're, I can see the smoke. I, you know, I just love the straight up pie. <laughs> so, I think about King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> and what happened with him when he continued in his rebellion against God? What did God do to him? Oh, he struck him. He struck him, and he behaved like an animal out in the wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a violation of his free will? Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar's? Because he chose to do that. Yeah. God, like it sounds like God personally acted upon him in such a way that that violated his free will. Yeah, and if that's we're, possible, we're, couldn't he? But he didn't do that 100 percent of the time. No, 100 percent. We're we're but all a slave. An option. We're right. all a slave, either to God or to sin. Mm -hmm. So he had that right with his to, slave to permit something to happen or cause it. I think we're going to end up with two weeks of chapter 13. <laughs> um, but also each new leader presents an opportunity for us to teach us patience, to teach us like the control only what we can control, what the government does, we can't stop. It. Right. Okay, now you bring up a good point in the fact that, yeah, we may disagree, and, and we'll, I'll get to there because this will follow what David's first question was, but we have a responsibility. And that was to obey the governing authorities, okay? Because one, we are strangers and aliens. We are not of this world, even though we're in it. Our world is heaven, to be with Christ. So even though we, we talk about uh, 
God will use those positions of authority. We can go back to the book. We can go to Esther. They captured these girls and they brought them in and, th and then they had to go before the king because one, they were slaves. And two, they were virgins. And the rule came out and they had to. They were forcibly made to do that by the rule of the king. And now we're really going into a rabbit hole here. But you see how it turned out. Okay. But God put a lot of people in power through the children of Israel, and bad people were good people. And the children of Israel suffered, but his plan was for them to remain faithful. Yes. And is that not our plan? That's our plan. That's our plan. And, and you bring up another you, you bring up another good point. And, and, and David and Eric and now Cinda. <clears throat> I, I can see where they're coming from. So the reason why he does this, the reason why God does this, is to keep order. God is a God of order. Discipline. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at creation. You see how creation happened, day one through six. And it was in order, all right? In Corinthians, Paul admonishes the Corinthians to do everything decently and in order because they work so he is a god of order so you obey the laws of the land what have you to fear you go down the highway at 70 miles an hour and the speed limit is 35 what do you have to fear smoky's gonna light you up yeah you're gonna get lit up you run a stop sign and there's a police officer on the corner what do you have to fear what was that? <laughs> Did you do it? No. no. I see it every morning though. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So he puts these he puts these people people in a position of authority and we must obey the laws of the land. Who's to say you just can't go out and kill somebody because they ticked you off? And it's happening. Some nutcase will because he wouldn't let me have my hamburger, he shoots it. So now he is going to be subject to the authorities and he will receive the avenging punishment that is there. God, God put those there. He, the laws of the land are there, even though some of those laws are stupid. Not, not if they're in certain states. <laughs> well, yeah. In certain states, they turn people loose and kill people and everything else. That's how yeah. bad our economy, our economy, our government is yep. right now. Oh, there's another rabbit hole. <laughs> this is going everywhere. But no, I mean, God is a God of order. So let's go to Mark chapter 12, 13 through 17. Mark 12. Whoever gets it first, please read it. 13 through 17. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is on this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to God the thing that are, things that are God. And they marveled at him. Okay, so they put Jesus to the test. How many of us like to pay taxes? <laughs> I don't go to jail. <laughs> no, I, I said, oh, okay, like to pay taxes. So set put her hand up. Okay, I don't like to pay taxes, but we pay taxes. Because one, we have to, and two, a lot of times you see where those tax dollars are going. Because it's going to the police, fire, uh, schools. Uh, so the, the infrastructure. Uh, but the problem is some of, those, some of that money will go to maybe someone who's corrupt. But we don't have control of that. That is that individual's, and they will answer to the ultimate governing authority. Okay, here is the question, and this is what you have posed. 
What about civil disobedience? As a Christian, I am going to defy the law. Whoa. The Bible says not to return evil for evil. Okay, so Nero was doing evil. What did the Christians do? They suffered and died. Fear not the one who can, who can destroy the body, but who can destroy the, the soul and the body in hell. That would be God himself. And that individual, if they're corrupt, they will be found out. Maybe not in this life, but in the life to come. Uh, a good example of this is found in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. And let's go over to there and take a look at how this played out. Because we have two apostles who actually healed a lame man in front of the temple. And now they're brought before the Sanhedrin. And uh, who has the passage? You got it? Go ahead and read it. Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Okay. So, I have a slide. I got a slide. So here we have Peter and John in front of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. And they're accused and they're, they're told, don't do that anymore. But there are, this is, this is their answer, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. And they knew that what, what they were asking. You be the judges. And as for us, we can help, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Jesus told us to behold, I send you forth the sheep in the midst of wolves, but he be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Were Peter and John that in that in that confrontation with the Sanhedrin? They were wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. Because they asked the right questions. They made the right statements. Jesus did the same thing. Sometimes he did it a little bit more when he was addressing the scribes and the Pharisees because he's seen them for what they were, hypocrites. And that's what we don't want to be called, a hypocrite. This is only the second part of three, and I know I'm running out of time. So the second part is, any questions or comments about the first part? Yeah, I think, you know, going back a little bit, just the people in, in you know, government, government authority and, you know, God put them there. But then he also gives us then a way to change that, you know, to learn from that. Mm -hmm. You know, if there are issues with the particular, you know, government or, even, you know, even your own mayor of your city or your councilman or whatever, mm -hmm. you have that ability to change that <laughs> by your voice and say, I don't agree with this and this is why. Is there anybody who's following me? And you know, that's, that's our right, you know, in this country anyway, mm -hmm. to be able to say, if you don't like it, you know, here's a change. So that is something that he gives everybody that free will. You know, so, because you know, if you look back, anytime something happens in any government, is, you know, it's easy to say about this country, is that you know, what did we learn from that four years or eight years? Let's don't repeat it. Mm -hmm. So, And with a voice that God gives us to make that change, you know, and you can't just say, I'm not going to vote for that person. There's got to be a reason. I, know. You know, I mean, there's plenty of reasons. There's always, you know, reasons to do that. But, you know, I think you know, if you think about it, you know, God would be probably considered an independent voter, if you will, you know, gonna vote for the person. <laughs> Write him in. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna be like an independent. He's not gonna let you sway him one way or the other. You're gonna be stuck and you're gonna be, you know, very, 
very ready to say, you know, I agree with this person, whether they are a member of the party that I follow, but in this country, the independents will probably never get those. <laughs> well, you know, never get those. again, when I was a scout leader, one of the things that, uh, in, one of the things of the scout law was uh, reverence. And, and it not only dealt with matters of faith, but also in matters of democracy. So if you've seen a law or you've seen something that you did not like, you would do exactly what you're talking about. You would take steps to decently kind of change that through the democratic process. Now, when you have a dictator, that's a little different, and that's in another country, but still, you would have to try to change that. Terry, you got something you wanted to say. going to still assemble and if the left keeps pushing the way they're pushing you're going to see a lot of major 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 problems related changes here in the yes. mm -hmm. and that's that's where um, the question of civil disobedience comes because you know when the church was under duress what happened to it it grew it grew our, our human nature, if they tell you, you can't do this, what are you going to do? Get that cookie out of the jar on top shelf. Don't get into the cookies. You're not allowed to have them. Well, didn't we walk them all out and eat all the cookie dough anyway? Yeah, we did. <laughs> Pam made chocolate chip cookie dough, and Jason and I wanted a taste of the cookie dough, and... Somehow we got Pam outside and we locked her out of the house and we found a cookie cookie dough bowl and we stepped, stood there at the door eating the cookie dough while she was outside watching us. <laughs> wow, that explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the adult here. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what I was thinking. No, but civil disobedience. I mean, we, we see that. How do, how do we do with civil disobedience? And I think, you know, if it comes to the point where we can't worship, publicly, we will find a way. Render to God what is God's, you know, and that's one of his laws. And that's what Peter and John did. Right. Yeah, it'll be tough. Uh -huh. We'll see. But, yeah. If you deny, deny me for a man, I'll deny you for my father. Right. So, we, we don't want to do that. And who knows, you might be able to bring someone to Christ that way. So, how about our, our relationship with believers and fellow man? So let's look at verses 8 through 10. And I know we're going to pick this up next week. Uh, so, so 8 through 10. And this is going to be another rabbit hole. So, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this... <clears throat> You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, so, what are some things we see in this passage? What's the first thing we see? Pay your bills <laughs> okay, well, okay, there it is. Okay. What is Paul telling the brethren here? The first thing he says, oh, nothing. Don't! <laughs> well, the marvelous of that. Okay. How, what does that mean to you? Individually, how is that? Oh, nothing to no man. No debt. <laughs> no debt. No sweat. Mm -hmm. Speed digs. What's the other one? Gary Ramsey, I think. Um, David, how do you... This passage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of people will see that and they'll say, man, I, I messed this one up. I'm dead up to my ears. My <laughs> Is that what that's talking about? Uh, I'm not from the original sure. language. I'm not entirely sure on that one. Just from a, a contextual 
to, he's just talked about not owing the taxes, not owing uh, the need for respect, respect to whom respect is owed, owe nothing to no one, and then he launches right into fulfilling the law through love. Okay. I, I think he's transitioning into you you owe people love, mm -hmm. and you ought not owe people love. What about money? That's what we think of. Yeah. Oh, nothing. And we yeah. think of money. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly you don't want to, you don't want to be in debt if you don't have to be in debt. Okay. And if you are paying on the debt, you don't want to be behind on your payments. Okay. All right. I'd have to look into that. All right. Brad. We're, we're in Exodus right now in our daily Bible reading. Um, but, you know, there's somewhat, somewhat talked about when, you know, um, if you got something from somebody, you know, sometimes you had to work for them for seven years yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's paying off a debt. And I, I don't know if that may be a parallel there. It could be. I think, I think in this case, it means something different than, than a monetary debt, though. I think to, to love is the, the one debt that is never paid off. Correct. You're never going to reach full payment on the love we have for each other or for mankind. And that's the same thing as, because that's the example God has set for us through his son and what he has done. So I, I think it bears looking into. The second thing we look at, well, or love, okay? It's unconditional. It's not the fuzzy feeling. It's the decision. Man, I really don't like what you did to me, but I love you anyway. I really want to punch you in the nose, but I love you anyway, so I won't punch you. Can you verbally loving sock somebody? Because I can totally do that. Yeah, it's tough love. Take that. Um, love you is meaning. That's called turn the other cheek. Yeah, I'm not going to cheek you inside the room. That's when you were a kid and you were getting spanked. <laughs> One side got was hurting so much that so you turned the other cheek. <laughs> All right. That's why I can't love. Play. And I, I think I think we touched on. It. All right. The other one was, what is the distinguishing marks of a Christian? Look at. Um, love one another as I have loved you. Okay. That's it. All right. The distinguishing marks of a Christian is by your love for one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. Okay. As much as it hurts, we are to love. That criminal that's, that's convicted of murder and is given a life sentence. Especially if he murdered one of your family members. Yeah, you want to take him out. That's vengeance. I'd want to take him out. I'd want to see him burn. Wouldn't it be self-defense though? You don't want to let him do it to anybody else? No, I mean, if somebody breaks into your house, you're given the responsibility to defend your family. Well, yeah. God's not telling you, oh, just go ahead and let him do it. No. That's a different story. Take him out. I'm good with that. Vengeance is something that you plan to do. I'm going to get this guy back somehow, some way, somewhere. But love doesn't doesn't allow this. Questions or comments? Posers? I think we're going to stop right here because it's kind of like in the shack. When he had oh yeah, that's a good that's a good example. The shack. When he had to face uh, when he had to forgive the person that murdered his daughter. Mm -hmm. Very hard. Very difficult. So chapter 13 of Romans, there's a lot. I would suggest you read it again. There's a lot of things and a lot of lessons that come from that. Um, but I think just like in 1 Corinthians 13, love seems to be the foundation. And in here, it is the same. Next week, we're going to get into the believer and the last days and how we're to behave. Thank you again for your attention, and we'll pick it up next week.